education is a big word. We, of course, it's a, it's a word with a wide semantic range. But Jacques Barzun, the late historian who died at 102 just a couple of years ago, he wrote his magnum opus, Dawn to Decadence, in his 90s. Taught uh, history at Columbia University. He was writing about education in the 1940s. His books are still great. Well, Jacques Barzun said that schools can teach, but they cannot educate. And he's playing with that old, large meaning definition of education. Schools can teach. They can school, but they can't educate. What did he mean? Well, what education meant is this larger idea of unfolding a human soul that cannot be restricted to a classroom. He says it's like teaching civilization in a short course. It can't be done. The way you civilize a human being is not in a college course. That's one part of it. Schools can play a role in education, an important role, but they cannot own education because education takes the community, takes the village, it takes the parents, it takes community leaders and churches, all kinds of institutions and, 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 and community members working together. That's how you were educated. In fact, your education at college was not merely the courses you took, was it? It was the, the overall cultural liturgy, James K. Smith calls them. There are these cultural liturgies that shape us and, and, and point our heart and mind in a particular direction a, to a, towards a particular ideal of human flourishing. And a lot of that happens outside of the classroom. So teachers, you are educating even outside of the classroom. You know that students forget about 75% or so of what you teach them in front of a whiteboard after a week. So what are we doing? We were teaching them the way we were taught. And we went through this cycle of cram, test, and forget. And that's what our administrators want us to do. They want the grades. They want the reports. The te even the parents want to see those worksheets coming back and see them being graded, even though they don't remember any of their geometry either. So we move through in this frenzied pace, teaching using methodologies that don't cause knowledge and skills to even stick. We do it fast and we're stressed. And then we want to quantify and datify everything so that everything we do is, is readable by a computer. Machine readable data. Everything can be quantified and must be quantified if we're going to move it around, move the results around, and compare student to student and school to school. That's what we do. And educators have become educational technologists, technicians, who spend a lot of their time doing this kind of stuff. And many educators after five years say, I don't want to do that anymore. Because when I got excited about education, it was because I loved mathematics. It was because I loved history and language, and I wanted other students to know these things. And I'm not doing enough of it. Scolé says that it can be a different way. And there's even examples of how they did it. For those of you in the Christian tradition, let me mention some places where in the Old and New Testament these things are talked about as well too. Proverbs 22, 28, don't move the ancient landmarks, the landmarks set up by your fathers. This idea of, of retaining the wisdom that's come to us from the past. Or Jeremiah 6, 16. Seek the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Some things from the past we need to transcend. Some things we need to conserve. It seems to me that every human being should be some kind of a balance of liberalism and conservatism. Liberalism says at its root, there are some things new that we need to do. There's, there's some innovation that's necessary, right? And conservatism <clears throat> says there are some things which we must retain. Getting both of those things right is sometimes a challenge. But I believe in the 21st century, educators must be both conservatives and liberals. And liberals. 
G.K. Chesterton said that every revolution is a restoration, and he's playing with that word revolve. It's another Latin word, woe, woe, if you use a classical pronunciation, Volvo, if you use the ecclesiastical pronunciation, means to roll. So the, the Volvo car company is well named. Re-Volvo means to revolve again, to turn again. And he says, every revolution is a kind of turning where you come back to where you started. And so every revolution is a kind of restoration. So you can be liberals, you can be revolutionaries by simply going back to some old ideas that are always new and always life-giving, like Scolé. Dorothy Sayers in her essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, says, people object to going back to old methods, and they say, you can't go back, you can't go back. And she says, distinguo, let's make a distinction here. Yes, in one sense you're right, depending on what you mean, we cannot go back in time, we can't time travel, and we probably don't want to use horn books and so forth or parchment paper instead of uh, iPads and laptops and so on. But we can go back, and we always go back, we continue to go back in the sense of correcting a mistake. We can go back to ideas. So some ideas are ever fresh and ever green. There is this revolving aspect. There's this, this you know, the old comes back again as new. And it's kind of fun being a classical educator because you're viewed as a novelty if you're a classical educator. Really, you do Latin? You do Latin in third grade? Whoa, where'd you get that idea? Teach logic for three years to seventh, eighth, ninth graders? Wow, it's kind of fun. The old has become new because we've forgotten, that's why. Well, it's interesting how even modern theorists, some of them, not all of course, even modern theorists are studying our current educational challenges and finding their way back to some of these old ideas when they weren't expecting to and discovering them in, on, in different ways. And I'll cite one person, a Harvard education professor, Tony Wagner, who was a high school teacher, then a high school principal, then got his M, his M. Ed and then his doctorate at Harvard. He said, I didn't really learn anything about education studying getting my master's degree at Harvard, and I, I learned a little bit when I got my doctorate, he said. But he spent a lot of time in schools. He's learned a lot by going to schools, visiting schools, talking to teachers and principals, and talking to business leaders. He wanted to find out from government, military, and business leaders, what skills do you need when students come into your, to your various uh, businesses and, and agencies and so on. And he wrote a book called The Global Achievement Gap a couple of years ago, and he, he highlights seven survival skills that he thinks we need to give to students in order to close the global achievement gap. By the way, some of you who are, are taking notes, if you email me at cperrin at classicalsubjects.com, I'll just send you this PowerPoint, okay? So when you're frenetic, frenetically, I don't want you to be frenetic. I want you to slow down. <laughs> And another thing I'd like you to do is start writing down questions, because we're going to have about 15 or 20 minutes at the end of this presentation for you to ask questions. We'll have some conversation. Crit number one, he says, critical thinking and problem solving. Number two, collaboration across networks and leading by influence. Number three, agility and adaptability. Number four, initiative and entrepreneurialism. Number five, effective oral and written communication. Number six, accessing and analyzing information. And number seven, curiosity and imagination. And he himself says that what prepares students best for this appears to be the old academic liberal arts curriculum. It stokes curiosity and imagination. It helps you to collaborate as you learn how to discuss ideas and think critically through the study of logic and the studying great works of literature and discussing their, their import. Uh, the ability to write and speak effectively is the study of rhetoric. So what goes around comes around. Even modern educators are becoming interested in some of what's happening in this renewal of liberal arts education or the renewal of classical education. Now let's talk a little bit more about skolé. Skolé is a Greek word. If you pronounce it skolé instead of skolé, it doesn't really matter, but it's skolé. 
I'll probably do it both ways. And it didn't mean school. But we get our English word school from scole. The German word school and the Latin word scola all come from scole. It was the Greek word for being at leisure to have conversation and discussion with friends. You've heard of Plato's Symposium, and, and Ron has even called this a symposium, um, which is appropriate because we're going to have some conversation, but he knows he's making the, he's doing this. Uh, symposium meant with drinks. I don't recommend that we, we, we do that in the, our high schools right now, uh, at least not with wine, but perhaps we need to have cups of coffee and cocoa and so on. But to have a symposium meant to get together and have a drink and have some discussion. So next time we do the symposium, I think Ron's thinking now we're going to have bottles of wine at each table and so forth. Scole meant to be at leisure, to have this, this kind of experience. Guess what their word for work was? The work that you had to do for practical living. Oscole. Not being at leisure. See what, they're, see what they're privileging? They're privileging discussion with your friends and education of this kind. And you, you, you work to earn your bread so that you can have scole. And we tend to reverse it in what Joseph Pieper calls the total world of work where work becomes privileged. And we always ask people, what do you do? Can you imagine asking people questions like this instead of saying, what do you do? What if I asked you, what are you? What kind of a person are you? That seemed to be more important in the Greek mind. Pieper, and, and much of what I say that's uh, about, about Scolet comes from this book by Josef Pieper, the German philosopher, it called Leisure, the Basis of Culture. And so if you get piqued and you're interested in going further, just get this book and read it six times like I have, and then you'll give this talk. Seriously, you will, because people will say, tell me more about that, and then you'll be passing this book around too. He says, only someone who has lost the spiritual power to be at leisure can be bored. Echoing Chesterton's comment that there are no dull subjects, only dull students. Pieper contrasts Scole to the total world of work in which we are so immersed in the practical utilitarian activities of our work that we can no longer even free ourselves to think about the higher aspects of truth, goodness, and beauty in the world to really begin to explore things in conversation. He says that Scole is not the cessation of work per se, but it's work of a different kind. 